Thanks, everybody, for coming out to talk about ringworm today. Um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on ringworm in cats and kittens, um, since those are the, you know, the animals we see it the most in, and focusing also on the management of ringworm in a shelter setting. Um, some of it's a little bit like technical and medical, but I won't go too deep into all the details of that, but I think it's kind of worth getting some of the background just so you can kind of get a full picture. So why are we taking the time to learn about ringworm? I think it's really important to consider that there are a lot of shelters out there that don't have the capacity to treat ringworm in their own shelters. Just due to capacity for care concerns and limited resources, they're just not set up for it. So unfortunately, euthanasia is a common outcome for many animals in shelters today that get diagnosed with ringworm. It's also important to consider ringworm in the shelter setting because it's highly contagious, and so it can spread throughout a shelter and cause outbreaks. And I think it's important uh, for all staff and volunteers to know a little bit about ringworm in order to better understand the reasoning behind different shelter protocols. Um, every shelter, I think it's really important to remember this, that every shelter is going to be set up differently. Everyone has different facilities, different resources. So a lot of the things in this talk, I'm going to try to keep it general. Um, and also just keep in mind that I'll make some recommendations, but you have to tailor all of this management to what fits your shelter and what makes sense for you. So it really depends on the facility, the resources, and the population that you have. So what does ringworm, uh, or what is ringworm in general? So ringworm is a superficial fungal infection of the skin, the hair, and the nails. And it's also referred to as dermatophytosis. Ringworm is a fungal infection, so it's not actually caused by a ring, or sorry, it's not actually caused by a worm of any kind. Oops. Oops. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Um, so what does ringworm look like? The classic ringworm lesion is an area of hair loss or alopecia with crusting and inflammation of the skin. You might also see broken hair or broken whiskers. The most common areas on the body to see these lesions are the face, the ears, the feet, and the tail. And these lesions may or may not be itchy. I don't tend to find them to be itchy, but sometimes they can be. Less common presentations of animals with ringworm are um, exudative skin lesions, so areas of hair loss with kind of like an oozing, sticky type of discharge from the surface, or large areas of hair loss with otherwise normal looking skin, or infections of the claws or nail beds. Um, and this kitten is kind of your classic poster child for ringworm. And I do think, especially since this is a staff and volunteer track, a lot of um, ringworm identification, I honestly, it's the volunteers and the staff that tell me about it the most. They're usually like, this kitten looks really ringwormy, or like, you gotta check out this really crusty kitten. So if you can identify ringworm, it's a huge help to the medical team. But it's also important to remember that there are a number of skin conditions that can look a lot like ringworm, but that aren't ringworm, including bacterial skin infections, dermatitis or skin inflammation secondary to flea infestations, allergic skin disease, skin mites, hair loss secondary to chronic irritation from food or diarrhea. That's really common in kittens that kind of get the food face or have chronic diarrhea and they just lose the hair on the uh, underside of their tail or the back legs. Feline chin acne, mosquito bite hypersensitivity. These are all just a couple of examples of things that can kind of look like ringworm um, and might fool you sometimes. The top picture is a cat with mosquito bite hypersensitivity causing some hair loss on the nose. And the bottom picture is a cat with allergic skin disease. Um, so there are a number of different species of ringworm out there. Uh, most mammals get some form of ringworm infection. Uh, cats, dogs, and humans can all be infected by the species of ringworm that we'll be talking about today. The most common species of ringworm that we see in dogs and cats and that are relevant to veterinary medicine and animal shelters especially are microsporum canis, microsporum gypsum, and trichophyton metagrophytes. And microsporum canis is really the most important one. It's the one we see the most commonly, and it's the one that's most commonly associated with shelter outbreaks. So there are a number of risk factors for ringworm infection in animals. Age is a big one. The pediatric and geriatric animals are the most uh, high at risk for developing a ringworm infection. Species and breed. Uh, cats are at greater risk compared to dogs. And long-haired cats, such as Persians, are at higher risk as well as Yorkshire Terrier dogs, for whatever reason, they um, are at higher risk for developing ringworm. Concurrent disease, uh, anything that causes immunosuppression, such as infection and immunosuppression secondary to FELV or FIV infections, even just the stress of pregnancy or lactation, malnutrition, chronic steroid use, 
cancer and other chronic disease states, or even just recent surgery, can in increase the risk of developing ringworm. Stress, which I think is really important to consider in a shelter situation, because no matter how beautiful or you know, wonderfully set up your shelter is, it's a stressful place for animals to be. And stress lowers the immune function, and it also reduces normal grooming behaviors in cats. Uh, which is actually a natural way for them to reduce the number of spores on their coat. So stress is kind of a two-pronged two uh, problem for ringworm infections. And also important in a shelter situation is considering their previous living situation. If your shelter is taking in cats from a hoarding situation or community cats or otherwise densely living um, animals or hunting and working dogs, those are all animals that are at higher risk of having ringworm. So how is ringworm spread? Ringworm is most commonly spread by direct contact with an infected animal, so really touching another animal that has ringworm. Um, however, infected hairs and spores do get shed into the environment, but infection from the environment alone uh, is actually pretty uncommon. The spores are the very small microscopic uh, infective form of ringworm, and they're formed by the fragmentation of the fungal hyphae. And they're super light. They can float up into the air and pretty much anywhere that you might find dust in a room, those are places where you can find ringworm spores. Um, the incubation period is a little bit variable, anywhere from four days to four weeks. Um, but lesions usually are seen about one to three weeks after that initial exposure. So something that's often discussed when we're talking about ringworm is whether an animal is a mechanical, ring, uh, sorry, a mechanical carrier for ringworm spores. Uh, which is often referred to as a dust mop, um, or if the animal is actually truly infected with ringworm and has an active infection. So mechanical carriers are animals that have spores on their hair coat from the environment, but they don't typically have skin lesions. On the other hand, an animal that has a true ringworm infection, those animals, um, the fungal spores have actually invaded their hair and their skin and they've developed uh, an infection and they've started to grow. And those animals do typically have skin lesions. So due to how easily ringworm can be spread in the shelter setting, it's very important that you screen all the, uh, um, sorry, all the animals that come to your shelter for ringworm. So, you know, a box of kittens is kind of the typical way we get our intakes. And um, this is one of our doctors doing an intake exam. So one of the best ways to screen for ringworm during your intake exam is to look for a combination of the clinical signs, which is really that alopecia, like the hair loss and crusted skin. Um, and performing a thorough woods lamp exam. And this is something that, you know, whoever's doing your intakes can do. So to briefly go over the woods lamp, the woods lamp is a quick and cheap screening tool for ringworm. It's an ultraviolet light, but it's a special kind of ultraviolet light. You can't just use any old black light. It actually produces a light of a specific wavelength with a peak at 365 nanometers. And that wavelength of light causes the hair that's infected by some strains of microsporum canis, which is the species that we're most concerned about in the veterinary setting. Um, it causes hair that's infected by that strain to glow or you know, fluoresce this bright green color. And based on a, well, so it's important to remember that it's only gonna detect microsporum canis, so the other two species that we're talking about won't show up um, under the woods lamp, but it is the most important one, so it's pretty helpful. And something that you might hear quoted a lot, and I still hear it from you know, vets you know, my age, um, is that it was previously thought that only 50% of microsporum canis cases would fluoresce. Um, and that was based on an old statistic. And now more recent evidence and most experts, experts actually think it's probably much higher than that. And most people kind of act on the assumption that the majority of these microsporum canis infections will fluoresce. So um, the woods lamp is actually a pretty reliable tool if you use it correctly. So in order for your woods lamp to be as accurate as possible and get as few false positives and false negatives as you can get, um, you wanna follow a few key steps. And remember to take your time. I feel like the biggest mistake people make is rushing through this. So first you wanna make the room as dark as possible. So close the blinds, turn off the lights. I even usually turn off the computer monitors just to get rid of any light that I can. And give your eyes a little bit of time to adjust to the darkness. And then you want to plug in and turn on your woods lamp and let it warm up for a little bit. It's usually just like three to five minutes, so you have to let it warm up. And I usually just plug it in, turn it on, and then do my physical exam and the woods lamp at the end. But then you want to hold the lamp as close as you can to the animal so you can see the individual hairs really closely. And it can be helpful to use one of the woods lamps that has a built-in magnifying lens just so that you can see the hairs up close. And then you want to carefully scan the entire body 
making certain not to miss the really um, important hot spots like the face, the ears, the feet, and the tail. And then, of course, going over any areas of hair loss or irritated or crusted skin. And a positive result of ringworm uh, will be that bright apple green or kind of neon green glow of the hair shaft, especially at the base. And the hair should glow, like the entire hair should glow. It shouldn't just be the crusts or the skin. And these photos are some uh, good examples of a positive woods lamp exam. So it's important to remember that the hair shaft itself should glow, not the skin or the crusts on top of the skin. The glowing of the hair shaft is actually due to a metabolite or a byproduct that the fungus produces, and it coats the shaft of the hair. So it's not actually due to spores on top of the hair. It's a, it's a byproduct of the infection. Um, sorry. So if you have um, a, like a suspicious lesion, like an area of hair loss and crusting, and it's not glowing like this, but you're still pretty concerned about ringworm, because those other species don't glow, you can't necessarily rule out ringworm with this, but it does, uh, it helps to identify positive cases. But if you do have a high suspicion, you need to um, pursue some further diagnostics to see if it's caused by another one of the species. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that there are a number of medications and other materials that will also glow um, different colors, oftentimes kind of a similar green color under the woods lamp. So it can make the fluorescence a little bit tricky to interpret, especially if you have a cat that you're you know, medicating with doxycycline or some eye medications. Doxycycline glows neon green also. So if you have doxy on the coat or they've been grooming themselves, it can make it a little bit tricky. Um, but the contaminants or the stuff on their fur that's not ringworm tends to look, um, I find that it looks smeared on top of the coat or the hairs get clumped together. Whereas when you see a really like a perfect slam dunk kind of with a positive lesion, you can really see each individual hair glowing and they look very clearly and separately glowing. So I think it's, it's really convincing when you see a true positive, but sometimes the contaminants can be tricky and those are ones that sometimes I, I don't call them positive, but I still call them suspect if I can't tell for sure. So another test that you can do to diagnose ringworm um, as like a point of care, you know, right away you can get the answer type of test is a trichogram. So this is a test where uh, you're looking at the hair under a microscope. So you're directly um, looking for signs of ringworm infection in that hair. And you can use this test to confirm a positive woods lamp exam, but I find it most useful if you know, your woods lamp exam is a little bit questionable and you just want to look into it a little bit further. <clears throat> so a positive trichogram can help diagnose ringworm, but if you don't see any of these classic hairs, like the hair on the left that's all swollen and frayed and looks very regular, it basically looks like it got blown up or something. Um, if you don't see that, you can't rule it out. So it helps if you see that perfect uh, image of a hair that's infected with ringworm, but if you don't see that, you can't rule out ringworm, so you still have to look further into it. And if this works, this is a... Ringworm screening can be performed by trained laypersons operating under a veterinarian design protocol and should include two people, one for animal handling and another for examination. At a minimum, when ringworm is suspected, the screening process should include a visual examination followed by examination with a woods lamp. Positive results should be followed up with a fungal culture. Where available, microscopic examination of fluorescing hair should also be considered. New single-use examination gloves should be worn when evaluating animals suspected of having ringworm. Step 1. Perform a visual examination. Thoroughly examine the skin under a bright light for any areas of hair loss, redness, pigmentation, broken hairs, excessive shedding, flakes, or crusts. Pay close attention to the muzzle, lips, around the eyes, ears, abdomen, toes, and tail. Step 2. Examine the fur with a woods lamp. A woods lamp is a special ultraviolet light with a 365 nanometer wavelength. It is not the same thing as a black light. Woods lamps that plug in are generally more effective than those that are battery operated. When ready, turn the woods lamp on and the examination room lights off. Allow two to three minutes for the observer's eyes to adjust to the light, then repeat the visual examination under the woods lamp. Look for hairs to glow blue-white or bright apple green at the base of the hair and along the shaft. Note that contaminants on the fur such as doxycycline, teramycin, and dander, can also fluoresce under a woods lamp. Contaminants can be distinguished from ringworm-infected hairs
because they are generally smeared or crusted on the fur, may cause individual hairs to stick together, and the hairs will not fluoresce once the contaminant is brushed away. Step 3. Once infected hairs have been identified, collect samples for microscopic examination and fungal culture. When sampling is complete, the examination area and the woods lamp should be cleaned, disinfected, and prepared for the next patient. Yeah. Um, so if you have a suspicious lesion and your initial diagnostics, like your woods lamp or trichogram, are inconclusive, that's when you'll want to either do a fungal culture or a fungal PCR to further investigate for ringworm. And if you have a high suspicion that that lesion could be ringworm, you should keep those animals separate from your general population until you get the results of those tests. Um, so to briefly go over the ringworm PCR in case you're using this in your shelter at all, um, the IDEX real-time real -time PCR test is a test where you take a sample from the animal that you're worried about. So you send them a sam sample of hairs and they're testing for the fungal DNA in, the, that, in that sample. And so because they're able to amplify the DNA with their special test, it's a really sensitive test in theory, but you can get false negatives, especially if you um, have poor sample collection, you don't get a good enough sample, you can still get false negatives. So it's not a perfect test. Um, but also you have to keep in mind that this test only gives you a yes or no answer. So the results on the bottom right, that's how the results come back to you. So it's just positive or negative for whether or not fungal DNA uh, for those species is detected. So it can't help you determine whether or not an animal is a dust mop or one of those mechanical carriers or if it's truly infected with ringworm, um, which I find this really tricky, especially if you have like hoarding cats, uh, because a lot of them are gonna be contaminated from that environment if there's ringworm in that home. So there's certain limitations to this test that make it helpful because you do get these results back usually within three business days, um, but it only gives you limited information. So I like using it, um, honestly, if I want to give myself a little more confidence to move an animal along with a lesion that I think could be ringworm, but probably isn't, Sometimes I'll do this test just so that I can, you know, move the animal along and say it's not ringworm, it's fine, uh, move on. Um, but it is more expensive than a DTM, so you have to keep that in mind also. It's also not a good test for tracking treatment progress or confirming cure after treatment uh, because you just get that yes or no answer and it can actually still test positive after treatment. Even if you just have little pieces of dead fungus on the coat, it'll still say positive. So uh, you only want to use this test in certain situations. So the next diagnostic test we'll talk about is the fungal culture. The fungal culture, or the DTM, is the most reliable way to diagnose ringworm. Uh, this test allows you to confirm the infection, track the treatment progress, as well as confirm the cure um, after a treatment. And uh, this uses dermatophyte test medium, or DTM, to grow fungus on the plate. And this is a special type of media that has an indicator within it that turns the media red when the pH of the media changes with fungal growth. Uh, the, the color change can help just identify um, or aid in the identification of ringworm colonies since it tends to ch uh, change color with the uh, fungal growth. Um, so just very briefly, we're almost done with the diagnostic stuff. Um, just reviewing how you'd collect samples and plate a DTM. First, you want to make sure your DTM plate is at room temperature when you plate the sample. So if you keep them in the fridge, you just want to set it out so it can reach room temperature for a little bit. And then you want to take an individually wrapped toothbrush and brush the entire animal um, from head to toe first. Uh, some people say brush for two to three minutes. Some people say to do 20 to 30 brush strokes. There are a lot of different recommendations out there, but I usually just brush the entire animal, making sure you don't miss all the like, really common areas, the face, the ears, the feet, and the tail. Um, and I make sure I get a lot of like, hair on your toothbrush. And then once you've gotten a sample from the whole animal, you want to go back to the suspicious lesions last. And the idea there is if it is truly ringworm, you're not spreading spores all over their body. So then go back and then I try to get a really good sample of any areas of hair loss or crusting um, or inflammation of the skin. And then once you have a really good sample, that's when uh, you can take your DTM plate and then gently press the toothbrush bristles into the plate. And you want to do the plating in a consistent pattern. A lot of people do just a spiral pattern around the plate. Um, then you can also, if you want to, if you have woods lamp positive areas, you can pluck some of those hairs since the woods lamp positive hairs will be the most likely to be infected with ringworm and then press those hairs onto the DTM plate and that can also help. Um, and then you just want to label the plate with the ident animal's identification number and the date and then store it upside down, do the condensation in the incubator and set the incubator for 80 degrees.
Um, and this is a short little video also. When ringworm is suspected, animals with positive screening tests, active dermatologic lesions, or a clinical history suggestive of ringworm should be followed up with a fungal culture. Where available, microscopic examination of fluorescing hair should also be considered. Additional means of diagnosis include culture or PCR performed at a diagnostic laboratory. New single-use examination gloves should be worn when handling animals suspected of having ringworm. Method 1. Microscopic Examination Prepare a clean microscope slide with a drop of mineral oil. Identify hairs that fluoresce under Woods Lamp examination and using a clean pair of forceps, gently pluck the hairs in the direction of growth. Place the plucked hairs into the mineral oil and examine the slide under a microscope using 4X magnification. Infected hairs appear wide and irregular. Occasionally, fungal spores and hyphae can be seen. Method 2. Perform fungal cultures. Before treatment has begun, Use a new toothbrush and vigorously brush the animal's entire body for a minimum of three minutes. Brush any areas with skin lesions last so as to minimize contamination of the rest of the coat. When complete, gently push the toothbrush bristles into a fungal culture plate. Starting in the center and working outward, cover the entire surface of the plate. Discard examination gloves and label the plate with the animal's ID number and the date of collection. Method 3. Diagnostic Laboratory To obtain samples for fungal culture, gently pluck hairs that fluoresce under Woods Lamp examination or those from the edge of suspicious lesions. Collect a minimum of 10 to 20 hairs and place them into a paper envelope labeled with the animal's ID number and date of collection. Place the prepared sample in the refrigerator until submission to the diagnostic laboratory. When obtaining samples for PCR testing, gently pluck hairs that fluoresce under Woods Lamp examination or those from the edge of suspicious lesions. Collect a minimum of 10 to 20 hairs and place them into a sterile sample tube labeled with the animal's ID number and date of collection. Place the prepared sample in the refrigerator until submission to the diagnostic laboratory. When sampling is complete, the examination area should be cleaned, disinfected, and prepared for the next patient. So once you have your DTM, uh, sorry, your DTM plate inoculated with your sample, uh, you want to be checking that plate daily to monitor for any colony growth. The red color change of the DTM plate with white or a slightly off-white fluffy colony growth is consistent with ringworm. Colony growth often occurs within a week, but it can take up to 21 days, and, and it can depend on the species of ringworm, so the trichophyton species are the ones that tend to take longer to grow. But it can also depend on if the animal's been on treatment or not. The um, animals that have been on treatment often take longer for their colonies to grow on the plate. Um, so it's important to remember that not all red color change of the DTM means ringworm. It's really just an indicator of pH change that'll happen sooner or later with pretty much any colony growth. But it is something that should um, kind of be an alert to be a little more suspicious about that colony. Um, but it's not a confirmation of a positive plate. Typical ringworm colonies do have red color change that develop around them as they grow. Um, no suggestive colony growth at day 14 can be considered a negative plate. DTM plates will also grow contaminant colonies, uh, so anything that's not white or, or slightly off-white, anything that's like gray, green, brown, um, black, like the kind of pigmented colonies, those are most likely to be contaminant colonies. So now we're going to very quickly uh, go over the pathogen scoring system, um, if you do use this in your shelter. One of the really big advantages of using a DTM plate to diagnose ringworm is that you can actually find out a lot of information from the number of macroscopic colonies on the plate. So the white dots on the plate can give you a lot of information. Um, so you can use that to determine the severity of the infection and also monitor treatment uh, progress when they're on treatment. 
in theory, the number of colonies should get lower and lower. And it can also help you make some pathway planning decisions um, and treatment decisions. So P scores range from one to three. Um, a P score of one is if there's only one to four colonies. P score of two is five to nine, uh, you know, white dots on the plate. And then P3 is 10 or more. And once you have a fair amount of colony growth on your DTM plate, you can then perform the microscopic examination of the colonies to confirm the diagnosis of ringworm as well as determine uh, if colony growth is due to ringworm or a contaminant colony. And you can also determine the species of ringworm uh, by looking at it under the plate or under the microscope. Um, microscopic examination can be done in-house if you train you know, your techs or your vet uh, to do this, or you can send it out to a, la a laboratory. In the early stages of growth, you don't always see the macrochinidia right away. That's just one of the stages of fungal growth. Um, so sometimes you have to recheck the plate in a couple days. And the top photo is what it looks like when you make a tape prep um, from the fungal colony, and the bottom photo is what microsporum canis macro macrochinidia uh, look like under a microscope. So that's how you kind of officially diagnose ringworm. So now that all the diagnostic stuff is over, um, before we jump into ringworm treatment, I wanted to take a second just to stress the importance of considering the animal's overall welfare when we're deciding whether or not to pursue treatment. Ringworm treatment requires prolonged confinement, typically weeks to months in isolation, as well as frequent handling for oral medications and topical treatments. So because of this, ringworm treatment isn't always safe or humane for all the animals that might be diagnosed with ringworm. So an example of this might be a really under-socialized cat that's super fearful of humans. Treating that cat in isolation and shoving oral medication in its mouth and doing lime sulfur dips really might not be in that animal's best interest. It um, might cause a lot of like, fear and anxiety. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that a lot of animals in our ringworm isolation wards are going to be kittens, and they're at a critical time of their lives for socialization. So meeting their behavioral needs in isolation really can't be ignored. It has to be a part of your treatment plan. So while ringworm is a very treatable disease medically, we have to make sure we're making thoughtful decisions to select appropriate candidates for treatment, and then we have to make sure that we're able to appropriately meet their behavioral needs while they're in isolation. So when do you start treatment? Um, if an animal has skin lesions that are consistent with ringworm in a positive woods lamp exam or a trichogram, that's enough information for me to go ahead and recommend isolation and treatment. Um, if you have a questionable exam, um, like something that's like a little bit crusty, a little bit of hair loss, and your woods lamp exam findings aren't, uh, you know, slam dunk positive, and you're waiting on those DTM or your PCR results, you want to keep those ringworm suspect animals separate from your general population however you can, and just minimize contact with them if there's no other way to separate them. Um, and if you're highly suspicious for a ringworm, you can go ahead and start treatment before you get the confirmatory results if you want to, and consider it at least. <laughs> So treatment of ringworm consists of isolation, topical therapy, and systemic therapy. So isolation is a really important aspect of treatment. It's, in, it's essential for, prevent, for preventing spread of ringworm throughout the shelter. Isolation space will vary very much on just the setup of your shelter, like the facility you have. I've seen some shelters that have like a shed or a trailer that's separate from their main building. Some shelters have a separate room. This is a picture of the isolation room at the ASPCA. That's how we have ours. It's just a separate room that has a vestibule. Um, and then, you know, lots of people treat ringworm in foster homes. And so if you have them in foster, you just want to keep them in an area that's easy to disinfect and as separate from other animals as possible. So the way you isolate is just going to vary depending on your facility design and the shelter you work at. So topical therapy is really important for minimizing environmental contamination. Lime sulfur dip is the most effective topical treatment. But there are also other topical therapies out there that um, are used sometimes, including Maliseb shampoo, which is a myconazole and chlorhexidine-based shampoo, pure oxygen shampoo, which is an accelerated hydrogen peroxide-based shampoo, and alconazole, and also topical treatments like myconazole creams. Um, but it's important to remember that the lime sulfur dip is really the most effective, and so if you're trying to minimize treatment time, it's the one that's recommended. So lime sulfur dip acts to reduce environmental contamination by inactivating those spores on the uh, surface of the fur. It smells awful, like rotten eggs, if any of you uh, do these dips yourselves or do them in your shelter. They smell terrible, and they stain things like your clothes and you know, jewelry. So people don't tend to love doing these dips. <laughs> but it is recommended that the dips be done twice a week to be the most effective. Um, you don't typically have to clip the fur of the cats. It's um, I refer to cats a lot because they're the most common, but you don't typically have to clip their fur unless they're matted or have, have very long fur. Um, 
then it should be able to reach the skin. But so you don't typically have to shape them, but sometimes you do if they're really long haired or matted. Um, and, and lime sulfur dip is safe for lactating queens and kittens. So you can still dip them as long as you're providing appropriate heat support um, while they're drip drying. And due to the stress of um, lime sulfur dips, this is something we only recently started doing at the adoption center in, uh, in New York, is actually giving a dose of gabapentin about two hours before the dips just to help alleviate, alleviate some of the stress associated with treatment. Um, so it's just something to consider. Um, cats don't love being dipped, so <laughs> anything you can do to make it less stressful. So to quickly go over um, how to perform a lime sulfur dip, it's really best if you can use a sink or a large container and a small garden sprayer to gently spray the lime sulfur solution onto the cat. So merging cats into dip solution, like the dip bucket, is really stressful for a lot of cats, and it also causes cross-contamination if you're dipping multiple cats in the same bucket. So that method's not ideal if you can, using that, um, the setup that they have in this picture where you have a small garden sprayer and a, like a tub, you can kind of get the dip down to the surface of their skin without them freaking out quite as much. We've even, we had a hoarding case recent, recently where we actually started using the squeeze bottles that um, you, know, you have alcohol or peroxide in, in in the clinic, just to like gently squeeze the lime sulfur solution onto the fur, just because they were so nervous. But um, to make the lime sulfur dip, you want to mix eight ounces of the lime sulfur solution in a gallon of warm water. And it is really important to make a fresh solution of lime sulfur dip each time. Um, you want to soak the entire cat to the base of the hair shaft. It's really important that the dip reaches the skin. The base of the hair shaft is really where it needs to get. So not just on the surface of the fur. Um, you want to be careful around the face and the ears. Uh, you can use a cotton ball or a small piece of sponge just to gently dab the solution in those areas. And if you do get it in the eye, um, I find it's best just to use sterile saline eye wash to gently flush the eye, you know, as soon as you notice it. Um, I've seen places do, like, lubricate the eyes before the dips, but if lime sulfur dip actually gets in the eye with the lube, it can be really hard to get enough flush out to get the lime sulfur dip out of their eye. So I feel like it actually traps it in there more. So I usually just recommend having a bottle of sterile saline eye wash to flush their eyes if you get it in their eyes. Um, you also don't want to pre-wet the cat, and you don't want to dry the cat off after the dip. You just want to put the dip on dry fur and allow them to drip dry or air dry uh, after you dip them. Um, and it's okay if they groom a little bit of the lime sulfur dip off. Sometimes they get, like, their tongue will be a little bit white, but it's not toxic, so you don't have to actually put an e-collar on after them. Um, they're just going to groom a little bit. It's okay. <laughs> And it is important to provide heat support, especially for kittens. Uh, you can use heat lamps or heat discs, something to keep them um, maintaining their body temperature while they're air drying. And lastly, uh, systemic therapy is a really important aspect of treatment to help them clear the ringworm infections as quickly as possible. There are a number of different protocols out there, so I'm not going to get into it at all, really. Um, so there's not like a consensus on what's the best treatment. Itraconazole and tribinafine are the two oral antifungals that have been proven to be effective for ringworm. So choosing one of those is really where you, what you want to do. And uh, what your shelter chooses might depend on you know, the veterinarian you're working with, like what their comfort level is, what they like, or just the cost of the medication at the time, whatever is most cost effective. Um, you don't want to use compounded itraconazole, though. That is less effective. There are studies that show that. So using the brand name form is best for itraconazole. And um, it is important for kittens that you're rechecking their weight at least once a week and redosing them to make sure they're not you know, growing out of that dose range so you're treating them effectively. Um, there are a number of other products out there that have either been used for treatment of ringworm in the past or proposed as potential treatments, um, including, including griseofulvin, fluconazole, ketoconazole, uh, lufeniron or program, or even ringworm vaccines. A lot of these things um, either they're less effective or they have more side effects or both. So really, these treatments aren't recommended. Really sticking to either itraconazole or tibinafine is the best way to go. So once you've started your treatment uh, with your topical and systemic therapies, you want to be monitoring the animal's response to treatment and hopefully confirming cure at the end of treatment. The total time for treatment of ringworm is typically around six to eight weeks, but it can be as long as three to four months. So it's a long process. And you'll want to repeat the DTM cultures every week. So every seven days, you'll want to um, plate the DTM cultures again and continue treatment until you have two negative DTM plates taken a week apart. And you'll want them to be determined to be negative at day 14. So that's part of what, why it takes so long is confirming cure um, can take a bit of time. 
And you can also, if you want to monitor during treatment, you can recheck the Woods Lamp exam during treatment. The fluorescence or the glowing of the hair should get lighter and lighter as treatment goes on, and the fluorescing part should move towards the tip of the hair. So the base of the hair should start growing in normally, and the fluorescing part will just be at the tip. So that's another way to monitor response to treatment. Um, and sometimes hair uh, regrowth can take some time, so kittens sometimes just have like patchy hair loss even if they've cleared their ringworm infection. So um, this often is the case that you'll get a litter of kittens in or a box of kittens in, and only one of them has a classic ringworm lesion and is woods lamp positive. And you know, a bunch of them, you can't find any hair loss and there's no woods lamp. And there's kind of a question of like, what do, you, what do you do with them? Do you treat them all or do you treat them separately? And I'll say we typically treat them all uh, together. And part of that is to allow them to be group housed and have you know, kitten like litter mates to keep their behavioral health good while they're undergoing treatment. But also if you think about um, kittens just in general are at higher risk of developing ringworm due to their immune system not being fully developed. And like we talked about in the beginning, direct contact is the most common way that ringworm spreads. So a kitten that's been clearly in direct contact with its litter mates for its entire life has probably been exposed to a lot of ringworm. And chances are they're going to get a lesion at some point. So we usually treat them all together. But it is important to um, have each individual kitten get its own diagnostics. So you want to monitor each individual kitten's response to treatment and then cure them separately. And also, even if they don't come in as a group, if you have like a singleton that's uh, ringworm positive, uh, I recommend treating, uh, grouping them with another group of kittens, at least another kitten. Um, if anyone has a singleton kitten or knows the problematic behaviors that can develop, if they don't get the, profit, uh, sorry, the appropriate behavioral socialization, they can develop really problematic behaviors later in life. So for their behavioral health, I recommend pairing them or grouping them with some other kittens so they can uh, get that socialization. And it's ideal if they're at a similar stage of treatment, just so that um, they're not kind of contaminating each other. But So it also often comes up that people will say, you know, why do we even bother treating ringworm? It's a non-life-threatening disease, and it can resolve on its own uh, without treatment. So why would we even treat it in the first place? Um, first of all, ringworm is a zoonotic disease, meaning that people can get it from animals. So working in a shelter, no matter what your role is, we're part of a public health profession, so we have to protect the staff and volunteers and adopters that are going to be interacting with these animals. Um, secondly, self-cure can take months. It typically takes about three months for an animal to clear a ringworm infection on their own. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that this is you know, not specifically focused on the shelter setting. In a shelter setting where an animal is stressed out, more prone to infectious disease, it's not an ideal environment. This could take even longer than three months. So it's not like in three months it's magically going to go away. That's kind of like a ballpark of when it might resolve on its own. Um, and treating ringworm is also important um, because of that reason uh, to reduce their length of stay and get them into a home more quickly. And if you actually do the math and calculate what it costs to care for an animal, like house it, feed it, clean it, and care for it um, each day in the shelter, you're actually likely to save money by treating the ringworm infection by reducing the total numbers of, number of days in care for that animal. And lastly, uh, treating ringworm does reduce the contamination of the environment and spread of the disease. So there are a number of reasons why we want to treat this disease, even if it's not life-threatening. So some of the most effective ways of preventing ringworm spread in the shelter setting is to make sure you're screening for ringworm on intake. Uh, screening for animals before you introduce them to any type of group housing, appropriate use of per personal protective equipment, and isolation of infected animals, quarantining or just keeping them separate from the population uh, for any animals that you're afraid might have ringworm, it's either exposed or suspect, and following appropriate disinfection protocols. So um, especially this comes up a lot in foster homes for us. We'll send kittens out to foster and then they'll come back with ringworm and the foster will be like, well, what do I do now? <laughs> um, so once you have a ringworm contaminated environment, how do you decontaminate it? Ringworm is very durable in the environment. The spores can live for months or even years. So you can't really just wait it out. You can't just, you know, be like, oh, you know, come back in two years and foster then. You know, you want to follow these steps so that they can, you know, take some more animals back in their home. So the first step is mechanical removal of debris, which is really hair removal. And the second is cleaning with a detergent-based product. And a third is uh, disinfecting with a product that's proven to be effective against ringworm such as bleach or rescue or you know, accelerated hydrogen peroxide based products. So the best way to mechanically remove debris and hair is with an electrostatic sweeper, such as a Swiffer sweeper. 
Uh, you want to avoid sweeping as much as possible because that can kick dust and spores back up into the air and just spread them around. You can also use a vacuum or a steam cleaner to clean carpets and rugs and sofas, anything that has that fabric material. Um, and you want to make sure you're changing the bag after so you're preventing recontamination of the spores back into the environment. And then after you've removed as much hair as you possibly can, uh, you want to clean anything that you can clean with a detergent-based product, like a soap-type product, and then thoroughly rinse and dry the surface. Um, then you want to go ahead and disinfect with either Rescue at a 1 to 16 dilution or bleach at a 1 to 32 dilution, and allow a full 10 minutes of contact time before you uh, wipe that solution up. Um, and if you want to confirm at the end of your decontamination process if the area is actually fully cleaned, you can actually use a Swiffer sweeper and collect samples from the environment anywhere you might find dust type of places and then actually plate that Swiffer onto a DTM plate. Oh, thanks. As for laundry, you can wash clothing and bedding in a regular washing machine using hot water. Uh, you want to make sure that you don't overload the machine. It's really important to get a thorough wash and that agitation is really important for that. So making sure not to overload the machine. You can use regular laundry detergent for this. You don't actually have to use bleach. It hasn't been shown to be any more effective. Um, you do want to make sure that the laundry gets thoroughly dried at a high temperature, so you don't want it to be damp at all. And then once it's thoroughly dried, uh, just clean out the lint trap just to minimize any kind of recontamination. And when possible, it's really ideal to have separate designated staff and volunteers for ringworm isolation areas just to prevent any spread of ringworm to other areas in the shelter. And if that's not possible, you just want to have them handle the ringworm animals last. And another thing that often comes up is people ask me a lot, you know, what are the, what's their risk for contracting ringworm after they've interacted with a ringworm positive animal? Um, humans more commonly get ringworm infections from a different species of ringworm, but we can develop lesions from all the species that we talked about today, including microsporum canis. Um, these pictures are from human infections with ringworm with a different species, but this is just an example of what it looks like in a person. The incubation period is similar. Uh, a few days to a few weeks after initial exposure, uh, you're likely to see a lesion, kind of like an area of red, crusty skin. And the best thing you can do to minimize your risk of developing ringworm is using appropriate PPE and washing your hands. Um, even if you don't think an animal has ringworm, the best thing you can do for just about every infectious disease is wash your hands. So wash your hands as much as possible between animals. Um, and usually if someone comes to me with an area that's like, you know, do you think this looks like ringworm? I just tell them to cover it with a Band-Aid or some clothing and uh, to see their doctor for appropriate diagno diagnosis and treatment. Um, the most common complication of microsporum canis infections in immunocompromised people is a prolonged treatment time. So uh, it's not generally life-threatening, but it is something to consider in immunocompromised people. It can complicate things. Um, and this is really important, especially for all the volunteers in the room. Volunteers provide really important socialization for animals undergoing ringworm treatment. Providing for the behavioral needs of animals undergoing treatment really shouldn't be considered optional. It should be a mandatory part of their treatment. And so because of this, volunteers really play a huge role in making the treatment of ringworm possible in our shelter and probably yours too. And I wanted to treat, uh, touch just briefly on the option of treating ringworm in foster homes. A lot of shelters are moving towards foster-based care of kittens, and ringworm is a very common disease in this population. So fosters that are willing to take in uh, ringworm kittens and treat them in their home do really important life-saving work for a lot of shelters. Um, but you do have to make sure you're picking the right foster and that they fully understand the risks, um, including the potential for people and pets in their home to contract ringworm. Um, it's really best if they can house the ringworm positive animals in an area that's easy to disinfect and away from other animals. And they should wear either designated clothing or personal protective equipment while they're handling those ringworm positive animals. Uh, but one of the advantages of treating ringworm in fosters is that you can be a little bit more flexible with your treatment plans. Um, so if a foster really doesn't want to do lime sulfur dips, you could consider swapping it out for a less smelly alternative. Um, that just might increase compliance and make more people willing to take a ringworm positive animal to their home. You can also consider spacing out your DTM rechecks, uh, maybe have it coincide with the FERCP boosters. So just because um, you don't have quite as much of a time crunch when they're in foster, they're kind of in a comfortable home out of the shelter, the time to cure might be longer, but it might just be a more comfortable situation for that animal. So you can kind of get a little bit more flexible with your treatment plans. And just quickly, ringworm in dogs 
It's considered less contagious compared to cats, and ringworm in dogs is typically cleared more quickly compared to cats. So each shelter, um, if you have a ringworm positive dog, will just have to determine how to best house and care for those animals in order to maintain their behavioral health also while they're undergoing treatment. And like cats, ringworm is more common in the young and the immunocompromised. So just as a final reminder and a little takeaway point, uh, ringworm is a very treatable disease, but it's really important to consider the animal's overall welfare. The animal's mental health should be part of the decision as to whether or not to pursue treatment. And if treatment is pursued, the animal's behavioral health really has to be a priority while they're in isolation for treatment. Um, as for uh, additional resources and just references for this, if you want to get some like really good information, there's a consensus paper that's free um, that came out in 2017 that has a lot of the nitty gritty stuff, um, which is the top of the veterinary dermatology paper. And ASPCA Pro also has tons of webinars, and the University of Wisconsin Shelter Medicine program has a really great comprehensive ringworm website. So these are the three main resources I'd recommend. Thank, Thank you. you so much.